Lampman from the Senate motion as well, as well as Chris Humphreys from the Anfield Group and Greg Salyards from 2FA. So today we're going to talk about the NERC requirements. Um, we're going to talk specifically about advanced authentication and how we here at NetMotion and 2FA can help meet those requirements for you. So a quick agenda. Um, first, what we're going to do, uh, I'm just kind of the moderator here, so I'm going to hand it over to Chris. He's going to talk a little bit about the Anfield Group and then go into, you know, what are specifically some of the updates to SIP. Um, hand it back over really quick quick slide about NetMotion, and then we'll talk about 2FA and how 2FA can help meet those requirements. Lastly, we'll kind of end with, you know, some next steps on where you can go to get additional information and additional help, and we'll open it up to any questions anybody has. Now, everyone is muted on the phone, so if you do have questions, um, please use the question bar at the right. Um, what we'll do is I'll watch those, and if they come in in the middle of the presentation, then uh, we'll try to answer them then and there. If not, uh, if you want to hold off, we'll have plenty of time at the end to kind of dive into any open questions you have. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. And Chris, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Chris Humphreys. I'm the CEO and director of the Anfield Group. We're an Austin-based uh, cybersecurity infrastructure protection regulatory compliance consulting firm. Um, as the slide says here, uh, a little bit about my background. I was the the first NERC SIP auditor for Texas RE. I was the manager of audits and investigations, which Texas RE is one of the eight NERC regions responsible for enforcing these standards. Um, and my firm has myself and two other uh, auditor counterparts from the WEC region, or the western part of the country, uh, that you know we run this firm, and we're kind of that's our specialty is is the, the consultancy with the expertise as the former auditors that uh, kind of authored the audit process in place today that NERC implements. Um, but you know compliance is just one piece. We try to uh, you know build security programs that are sustainable and operationally efficient. So everyone chasing their tail to meet compliance, you know that's great, but. We'd like to leave to folks with programs that are sustainable far beyond the current regulatory model and, and focused on operational and, and security best practices. And the other key component of that while we implement programs is giving folks the technologies to sustain and automate the processes and controls because we believe, too, if you invest in building a nice, robust set of processes and controls but you're not leveraging technology to automate, you're really, uh, you know, uh, defeating the purpose of making that investment and really not maximizing uh, that that operationally sustainable uh, utopia that we're trying to achieve here. So that's kind of our strategy in a nutshell, a high level. And I'm also going to say, you know, this NERC discussion that I'm having here, I don't know the experience of everyone on the call, so it's some of it might be very high level and basic. I want to make sure everyone kind of understands where we're at now and where we're going with respect to NERC SIP. So we can go to the next slide. So here's the current version that we're under right now is NERC version 3. And there are eight standards that make up that framework. Um, and these are the subjects there, you know, SIP 2 through 9, everything from asset identification, critical cyber asset identification, uh, network security perimeters, training, management controls. You, you can see these are very high level. These are what the standards are currently that we're under. And again, NERC, the interesting thing about NERC is NERC has a $1 million per day penalty threshold per penalty. That's the highest of any regulatory framework in you North America. Measure. So the other interesting thing about that is, the other interesting thing about that is, you know, audited on three-year cycles and penalties are retroactive. So daily calculation, if you don't discover you had an issue till, you know, three years when you're audited and it happened two and a half years earlier in the audit cycle, that penalty is calculated daily. So the, 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 the penalty here can get rather costly. So that's the current landscape. Let's go to the next slide. So 2015, April 2015, where entities across the country are moving into implementing their NERC SIP version 5. So we went from version 3 to version 5. Version 4 got skipped. We're at version 5. 
there are talks of a version 6. FERC uh, still is requesting NERC to comment on the current version, address some issues around low assets and some other stuff like that, but that's pretty detailed for this audience. But ultimately, 2015 in April, people will be implementing their NERC 6 version 5 programs in order to meet the compliance date of April 2016. So they need to have instances of everything being executed in order to self-certify that they're compliant from 2016 in April. So differences from version 3 to version 5 at a high level. A uh, bright line criteria of low, medium, and high for asset categorization is new. In version 3, you just have a risk-based methodology, assessment methodology that requires you to consider certain things, uh, certain criteria, but it's completely up to the entity to decide well, I don't have that stuff, therefore I don't have to comply with NERC SIP. In version 5, there's bright line criteria breaking that onto the low, medium, and high, and there's also an attachment 1 criteria in SIP002 that says if you have this stuff, you are therefore critical and have to comply with all the NERC SIP standards. So that's going to expand the scope of entities having to comply with NERC SIP significantly from what's currently in place under version 3. The focus of this webinar and, and the areas that we want to focus on uh, as far as differences from version 3 to version 5 is around the authentication requirements. Um, whereas in version 3 it's very subjective and kind of broad, uh, there's much more specific language in version 5 around uh, strong authentication requirements, uh, interactive use, uh, access enforcement and authentication, and the intermediate system for uh, initiating inter interactive remote access, encryption, multi-factor authentication is required. I, I don't want to go into too granular level here because I think the other presenters on the call are going to get into that a little bit more, but to show you kind of what the big transitional step is from version 3 to version 5 is much more granularity around authentication uh, and encryption. And also in version 5, there are two new, completely new reliability standards, SIP 10 and SIP 11. Uh, configuration change management and vulnerability assessments, and information protection. So in version 3, configuration change management just says simply in a couple of requirements, you'll document changes to your environment and you know test them before you, you put them in place. That's it. Now you have an entirely new standard that says you're going to maintain the security baselines that require you know, a, you know software patches, ports and services, those kinds of things. Things you should already be doing, in my honest opinion, but now there's a regulation that's much more granular around configuration and change management. Information protection is more robust as well. And the other thing to remember too is uh, with the low, medium, and high criteria, there are varying requirements that are, that varying levels of requirements dependent upon that classification. So a high level is going to have formal requirements that you have to comply with versus a low. So the requirements for each, each, uh, each bright line class classification. So again, as I said earlier, NERC registered entities will have until April 2016 to become compliant with version 5, but that means they have to they have to self certify to be compliant in April 2016, which means they have to have their program already initiated and rolled out in April of 2015, or most people are starting now already to try to get those processes and get the solutions in place to address these requirements. Uh, and I think that's a do I have another slide? Let's go to the next slide. Nope, I think that's it for me. So I hope that kind of sets the stage for what NERC is requiring and where NERC is going. And now I'll let you know, the NetMotion guys and, and, and everyone else get into more detail around the access and uh, uh, authentication uh, requirements and, and, and challenges you guys are going to have. So that's it for me. Thanks for your time. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, really appreciate that. So hopefully that was, like as Chris mentioned, that was a good way to sort of set the stage, uh, you know, at a high level what the requirement is. Um, as you guys all know, you, you should be familiar with NetMotion Wireless. Um, we are a very strong partner with 2FA, so we'll let 2FA kind of go into the details of how to meet the advanced authentication requirements. But just so you know, also, you know, there's other things that NetMotion is already doing for you that are going to help you become compliant, such as encrypting the data. We've got FIPS 140-2 validated libraries. We also have a lot of control over policy, so we can control the access of, you know, essentially who can do what within the system. And again, we fully support, support multi-factor authentication, which is this new requirement, and uh, we've done a lot of work with 2FA in that, that world over the last couple of years. So we have a lot of experience with them um, and them with us. And so again, they're a really strong partner here. And I think 
what they can go to, specifically Greg will go into, is describing a little bit about what advanced authentication or multi-factor authentication is, because it can be confusing, but then also some of the, the benefits of actually going to that, aside from just you know the strength and security, there's, there's additional benefits as well. So Greg, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, John. This is Greg Salyards. Uh, I'll be doing the presentation today on multi-factor authentication. But uh, first, I wanted to give you an introduction to two, to who 2FA is. You're probably less familiar with 2FA in the, the energy space. We've been working very closely with NetMotion over the last couple of years on several other compliance-based industries. And as we see, the utilities industry kind of move into that with, CERC, with the uh, NERC SIP version 5 requirements. Uh, we're, we're starting to see some early adoption adopters uh, wanting to get to compliant now, getting their budget cycles ready for compliance in 2016. Uh, but an overview of who we are, we're a strong authentication software development company. So we develop what's known as a broad authentication platform that is comprised of a number of different uh, two-factor and multi-factor authentication uh, methods that can be used with NERC SIP version 5 requirements. We'll get into exactly what those are here in the next couple of slides. But understand that our product is different in that we do have multiple methods embraced within a single platform. So when you're out doing your analysis on what type of technology may be best suited, understand that uh, our experience from other industries has been that one size doesn't necessarily fit all, and there may be uh, a benefit for your organization by having multiple forms of authentication in the event that either one doesn't work or one's not available, or you have uh, a subset of your users that just need to do something differently. Uh, there are uh, vendors out there, such as 2FA, that have a, a broader authentication platform approach to the market rather than a single form factor. Um, energy, uh, healthcare, and public sector are our core focuses in that we uh, do focus on compliance-based industry. Uh, we, we have hundreds of deployments now uh, in conjunction with NetMotion. The platforms are very similar from a technical standpoint. Um, they're, they're deployed on Windows Server. They embrace things like IIS and SQL. So from an administrator standpoint, when you're dealing with the two products, um, you're, you're not having to deal with a, a different type of technology, a different architecture. Uh, 2FA1, uh, which is the server uh, and client product, is very similar to NetMotion Mobility XE as it relates to administration and interfacing. We have millions of, of licenses sold to well over a thousand customers, 25 countries. The software is developed in, in 11 different languages and we support very small organizations, uh, as few as, as 10. Uh, we uh, have large customers that are well over a million licenses. So we, we try our best to go out and get recognized in the industries that, that we serve. Um, but we also do a, a good job in that we submit our code out at the binary level to a company called Vericode that does a, an, an overall analysis of our software where we seek their highest rating and achieve their highest rating, which is EAL5, uh, A rating for mission critical life and limb systems. So that gives us the capability to deploy into healthcare organizations and nuclear facilities without having to have uh, kind of the fine line within our user agreement saying don't deploy these on X type of systems. And that's that's a key thing as a utilities company as you're going out and selecting vendors. Make sure that the vendors are willing to stand behind their products on the systems that they're deployed. We, we also have very tight integration into Citrix and VMware. So those organizations that are looking at um, embracing things like virtual desktop infrastructure with VMware View Horizon or Zen App or Zen Desktop, uh, we have a nice and elegant authentication approach to those products. Uh, both on the um, kind of a, a tablet or, or mobile environment as well as a standard traditional uh, desktop and, and laptop environment. Next slide. I'm not switching here, but I'm going to switch over. I'm on a slower bandwidth, I guess. So these are just some of our, our customers. As I said, we're seeing some uh, early adopters in, in utilities. Uh, we've been fairly broad deployed in energy, traditional oil and gas, and, and some um, traditional energy companies. But we're seeing some utilities companies uh, come on board earlier, um, specifically targeting uh, NERC SIP version 5 requirements. And what we're finding that 
uh, the benefit from our application is really twofold. One is the kind of anytime, anywhere access to the systems, so specifically things like BS systems that they're targeting. Uh, but having different authentication methods, whether they're in a vehicle and they're doing something with a fingerprint biometric or a contact smart card, or they're on a, some type of a mobile device and they're dealing with things like one-time password. The other benefit that you'll see with our software over some of the kind of the mainstream uh, authentication vendors is that we also do single sign-on within the same product. So a user has the capability to easily access a system using two-factor or multi-factor authentication and then have single sign-on into applications. So making it easier, especially for the mobile users, uh, not having to type and manage the complex passwords that we're seeing. Um, next slide. So these are some of the core drivers. We're spending the majority of the conversation today uh, talking about NERC SIP version 5, but we generally find within utilities companies is that there's other drivers as well. And we've covered some of the compliance issues in really, uh, uh, as I said, what we're talking today is NERC SIP, but there's also PCI DSS. This is around collection of uh, credit card data and personal information as it relates to financial data, um, as well as um, SOX for those out there that are, are public. Uh, but there are different areas in compliance that you may need to comply with. And what we recommend is look at compliance as really your friend. And you may find that getting budget sometimes is complex. As Chris had pointed out, this is the, uh, the strongest compliance requirement as far as a financial punch. If you are uh, caught not being compliant, up to a million dollars a day, fine. Um, and we saw similar types of uh, threats coming in in healthcare organizations. They weren't complying. There was data breaches. And now we're seeing some very hefty fines um, being levied against uh, organizations that are supposed to protect healthcare information. And that started pretty much uh, simultaneous with the launch of the regulations that were governing them. And that it, it took a number of uh, months for the healthcare organizations to catch up and say, okay, this really does have some teeth. And we're seeing the, the federal government and, and the regulators really come in and they are standing behind uh, their, their, their fines. This is a, a way for them to generate revenue. Um, so understand that use compliance as your friend use this as a capability to go to the folks that have the purse string, say this is what we need to do, this is why we need to do it, and you can show them the copy of the uh, SIP guidelines. Um, and use it to, to get things that you receive pushed back on, whether you need new servers, you need new firewalls. Part of the infrastructure that required that's required for advanced authentication can help you solve some of your everyday challenges as it relate to budgets. What we find a lot with our product is that companies initially look at us, well, we have a compliance requirement, we have to do this. Uh, but then when they start looking at it, they say, you know, this can really solve a lot of our other problems. We have uh, password reset issues, so we have a tool around self-service password reset. We have capabilities to manage uh, uh, passwords that are difficult to manage on things like BES systems. Uh, we have ways to do single sign-on into applications so users aren't having to change passwords and manage passwords and remember passwords that we know get get hacked and commonly written down and put in, and shared with, with other users. So not only are we able to comply with the guidelines, but we can make the lives easier for the end user. And when we find that the uh, experience and the workflow of the end user is enhanced, they'll adopt that technology and they'll embrace that technology and use that technology. So as, as you're looking for, for uh, a best practice within your organization, and not all organizations are the same, look for a technology that the end users are going to adopt. So get it out there in pilots, get feedback from your users, find out where the pain points are, and make sure that the technology that you're deploying is going to address those pain points. Cost reduction with our solution is an area that you can achieve through things uh, specifically related to self-service, so put things in the hand of the end users, keep them productive, make their authentication processes faster, make them more secure, uh, make it so they're not having to call up the help desk for resets. Uh, a lot of times what we find when we're going over from passwords is that historically passwords needed to be eight characters, alphanumeric, contain special characters, be changed every 90 days or 60 days, and passwords, uh, you know, general users were having to manage a lot of them. So if you can bake this down to where they're 
um, using something like a smart card or a one-time password or a fingerprint biometrics. And I'm going to focus in on those three during the presentation, and you'll find out why here in a minute. But if you can get them to reduce to a two-factor solution where it's something they have, like a fingerprint or a one-time password, or excuse me, something they are, like a fingerprint or something they have, like a one-time password, and something that they know, such as a PIN or a longer password, that doesn't change, um, you'll find that the self or that the passwords um, will become less of an issue, um, security will be enhanced, and the overall user experiences will be better. Next slide. So specifically, what are we talking about when we look at NERCSIP version 5 for remote access? So the real target is things like the substations. It's secure. It's securing the remote access to those systems. So systems that are generally used in process control environments to, to monitor. Um, the regulation itself is very specific as far as what a BES system is and some of the criteria that uh, needs to be applied. In the majority of cases, you know whether or not you, you need to comply or not. Uh, we will be having follow-on webinars for this. This is more of an introductory one, but we'll have some follow-on webinars that go deeper into identifying those systems and going through some of the workflows. So we want to look at specific processes that can be employed to secure access to those systems. And you need to look at how users are authenticating to them today. In the majority of cases, they've created like air gap networks, so um, they're not part of the corporate networks. There's new technology that's coming in, whether it's smart grid and smart processes, that they're, those types of systems are needing to be, become part of a corporate network or need to be connected in. And that's where the challenges come into place, and that's where the security and critical infrastructure protection becomes a requirement. Next slide. So when we specifically look at multi-factor authentication as it relates to uh, NERC SIP version 5, think NIST requirements. There will be a lot of vendors that are talking to you about kind of the, the latest and greatest technology um, where I outlined the three that you should be focusing on. Our most common form of authentication that we sell with 2FA is actually an RFID authentication where users are using the same type of technology that they use at the, at, at the door to authenticate the desktop into applications. Um, unfortunately, that is not going to be a NIST approved, uh, what's known as EAL level three type of technology. So you need to be aware of certain types of authentication methods that may not be compliant with that. Things like uh, SMS push messages that are out of band may not be compliant and that there's no cryptographic processing that's uh, in involved. But when we talk about multi-factor today, we're really looking at three core factors. There are some more out there, but the three core factors that we're looking at is something that you know, which could be a PIN or a password, something that you are, which would be some type of a biometric, whether it's facial or fingerprints or voice, and, or something that you have. And generally, the something that you have, it needs to have some type of cryptographic processes on it, whether it's a one-time password generator, a contact smart card, and for those of you who, that may not know, contact smart cards are uh, generally credit card size cards that have a little chip, usually a, a brass looking chip on the on the front of it. Uh, those of you that have been involved with DOD or government, there's the CAC, there's PIV cards, and other types of cards that uh, do secure processing. There's a picture of it down here in the bottom. Um, those are becoming more and more common uh, as we see things like the uh, Target breach and Neiman Marcus and uh, other breaches, Home Depot. Uh, there's going to be more secure processing as it relates to credit cards. This is something that's existed in Europe and in, uh, in other places in the world for quite some time, but the U.S. has really kind of pushed back on embracing that technology. Uh, but you are going to see that. Uh, so your personally identifiable information and financial information is more secure you're going to start seeing that more and more in the credit cards that you're using on a daily basis. Um, but the device itself needs to have some kind of capability of doing um, cryptographic processes. There are things like scratch cards and grid cards and other types of technology that early on, when we were just uh, talking about uh, NERC SIP in version 3, there were some scenarios that were defined. Those are, have been clarified in uh, NERC SIP version 5 and they're really looking at NIST EAL level 3. The other thing you want to be looking at is uh, FIPS 140-2 approved authentication methods. And a good example of this would be fingerprint biometrics. 
So fingerprint biometrics are uh, considered to be in scope within the policy, but it also requires you to use a FIPS 201 uh, approved biometric reader. And those are going to be different from what you're going to see in your standard uh, laptops and some of your tablets. You can do build to order solutions through Dell and Panasonic and Fujitsu and some others that provide you a FIPS 201 certified device. Those are generally the ones that they're delivering to the federal government, but they're not generally the ones that they're, they're delivering in standard business systems. Um, so if you are considering to do things like fingerprint biometrics, make sure that you have a FIPS 201 approved reader. Um, and generally, in this case right now, we are looking at only fingerprint biometrics. There, there are other biometrics out there, but uh, from an audit standpoint, fingerprint biometrics are going to be your safest bet. The other area is one-time password. Uh, we've seen a lot of increase uh, of use and different types of form factors in the one-time password space. So those of you that are familiar with things like RSA Secure ID, uh, where you have a little football-sized token or fob that you keep on your keychain, uh, that, is a, that is an approved method, or method for uh, NERC SIP version 5 compliance. Uh, there are a lot of other vendors out there in the space right now that are providing similar type tokens at uh, competitive pricing. The other key area is that the technology has moved, uh, kind of seen a pivot in that space towards more of a mobile, using your phone as the factor, environment as the something you have, has the same capability to do cryptographic processing and is an approved um, FIPS uh, EAL level, or excuse me, NIPS, NIST EAL level five, uh, three method. Um, so these are generally uh, applications that are provided by vendors that can be downloaded from from Google Google Play or the App Store um, that require some form of licensing. Um, make sure that they're using an, a commonly accepted algorithm, things like OATH, which is O A T H, uh, H O T P, which is their uh, event-based or TOTP, which is their time-based algorithms. So that's the generally accepted algorithm that you'll see other than some of the RSA and VASCO algorithms that are out there in the community. Um, stay away from uh, static uh, things like the grid cards, the scratch cards, uh, the out-of-band type of uh, one-time passwords if they're not using an approved algorithm. Um, contact smart cards, uh, very versatile. Um, generally used with uh, a public key infrastructure. Microsoft is a nice free alternative out there. There are other systems out there for public key infrastructure. They come in credit card size. They come in uh, USB form factor size. And there's some other form factors out there. Um, the nice thing with this is that you can get things like pre-boot authentication. You can get digital signatures, uh, email encryption, file and folder level encryption. So you can use it for other things. The other thing to note is that this is what's used in the federal government. So if you look at, you know, if the technology does pivot and it tightens up, um, this would most likely be the technology that the policy goes towards in that it's fairly broadly used throughout the, the federal government today. Next slide. So when we look at how, how we comply, we, we really address the overall core areas of NERC SIP from a platform approach. We have the capability to provide an, an enroll once, authenticate anywhere type of um, platform so a user can enroll on a, on a specific device and then any managed device from that environment they have the capability to authenticate on. This could be with things like fingerprint biometrics, assuming that a FIPS 201 reader is used, uh, one-time password. The nice thing that you'll get with one-time password is a lot of versatility. There's a number of different scenarios that are uh, spelled out within the uh, NERC SIP version 5. Uh, one that I, I like is the third-party contractor that needs to get into a system but doesn't have a one-time password token. There is a, a, a voice verification system process that you can go and provide a, a uh, one-time password uh, to a third-party contractor for them to enter it into a VPN and then gain access to, to, to the system. Um, so that's that's one of many different ways. Uh, but what we try to focus on at 2FA is, is complying with the policy, making it more convenient for end users and reducing costs for the overall end user. Next slide. So our solution is an all-in-one solution. So things like single sign-on, all of the different forms of, of uh, multi-factor authentication that we discuss, 
the integration with Citrix and VMware, self-service password reset, and emergency access to systems, a nice uh, and elegant uh, compliance reporting tool, the ability to issue and manage certificates on, on devices. All of that's included within the product. So you technically could have a user that's using a one-time password application on a, an iPhone and that's using fingerprint biometrics and that's also using a contact smart card or a part of your organization that's using a different form factor for authentication in their, in non, uh, and non-SIP uh, areas. Um, all within the same products, you have the capability to mix and match. You have the capability f from embracing one technology to migrating over to another technology over time. The other benefit that you get is not having a single point of failure. If you, for some reason, decide to go with smart cards and that's not available or it's not working, that same user can have one-time password as a nice fallback or use some other uh, form factor in the event that it, it, the primary isn't available. Next slide. So, so we focus on a, on a number of areas. Uh, the first and most common is Windows logon. So this is securing your, your standard Windows systems, whether it's XP, Vista, Win7, Win8, or whatever comes next. But having the capability to add to the logon environment to make it more secure and easier for users to authenticate rather than putting a username and password and having that change every 90 days. We have the capability for a user to insert a smart card and enter a pin or swipe their finger, tap their finger, and have a capability to log on there. What's not currently supported but will be supported in the next major release of 2FA1 is the ability to do a one-time password code here. It would need, the system needs to be online, connected with NetMotion. Um, that's going to be with the OTH, T-O-T-P algorithm, but that'll give you the capability to have compliance with all three of the major authentication methods that we talked about today. Uh, the next area, next slide, is shared workstation. This is key for uh, users or organizations that have systems that aren't domain joined, and they're right now they're logged on with just generic credentials, but maybe secured in a secured area or have some access control to them. But uh, for one reason or the other, the systems aren't uh, able to be logged off. They need to be online at all times and for either monitoring or for processing. And you need to make sure you can uh, control access to who has access to that system and audit it. So what we've done with Shared Workstation is that a system can be online and running at all times. And users can come up and authenticate to a secure shell that's wrapped around the operating system and have the capability to authenticate securely in a NERC SIP version 5 required authentication method, but then have an auditable event uh, associated with that, uh, that logon. Next slide. Next area is single sign-on. This is definitely an area for convenience that makes it easier for users. Uh, therefore, they're not writing down passwords. They're not having to manage their passwords. They're getting in and authenticating with a, with a secure, um, compliant method, and then our software is facilitating the single sign-on events for those other applications. And they can be browser-based applications. They can be web-based applications. Very rapid ROI, very high user satisfaction. And it's nice to deploy in conjunction with a security application because it makes their lives easier in the event that they use the technology. And you can make it so with our technology, the user has to authenticate with two-factor authentication or they don't get the benefit of accessing those applications. Um, and there's a number of ways that this can be deployed that the users don't even know what their passwords are. So forcing them to authenticate with two-factor authentication. Next slide. So, so remote access, really the key for NERC uh, SIP version 5. And generally what we think about when we think about remote access is, is a one-time password technology. Uh, what we've done here at 2FA is that we embrace the majority of the form factors. So whether that's a a token-based solution. We also have a credit card size, one-time password generator. Really where the market's going is more mobile-based uh, solutions. One thing to point out is that it's not approved to have a soft token generator on an operating system on which you're going to be doing the access. So uh, for those of you that are using like a soft ID type of uh, application or are familiar with those, you can't use those to actually generate the one-time password and then put that into like a NetMotion VPN. It has to be two separate uh, devices. For our solution, this is generally uh, for the mobile. Uh, as I said, you can download a free application from the App Store or Google Play. We will be supporting the Windows Mobile environment in uh, December. 
Uh, these are free downloads that uh, link up with our server. There's a nice uh, enrollment process for end users. The users don't have to be domain joined, so you can uh, support third parties with this a very rapid provisioning and low cost of ownership model uh, for supporting one-time password. Um, from an architecture standpoint, you're, you're looking at uh, a free BSD, uh, free radius server uh, to communicate with NetMotion. Also needs to have the uh, Microsoft NPS server. So overall infrastructure with one-time password with 2FA and NetMotion will require a uh, 2FA server uh, on Windows Server 2008 or 2012 R2, um, and then a uh, Microsoft NPS radius server as well as a free BSD uh, server running free radius, and that's specifically for the translations that need to occur on the different protocols. Um, NetMotion's position is to embrace the most secure protocols, which is a wise approach, uh, and in order to accomplish that, we need to have some translating services in there. Generally, an infrastructure like this with 2FA and a customer takes about between four to eight hours to install and get trained up on. Next slide. So we look at what's next. Now, this is a an introductory uh, webinar for you. So it's what is the policy about, when is it coming, uh, who are some resources that are here to help you. Know that uh, that the three companies here on the phone are, are, are prepared. We do have some customers that are already deployed. In the future, we'll probably bring some of those on to talk about some of the uh, challenges and lessons learned that they did through their, their deployment. Uh, but start thinking about it. Start budgeting for it. Uh, we're always available to we'll provide you a, a quote. Uh, we can also go through some of the workflows, um, document the workflows for you. Uh, that's generally what we're doing early on with customers and saying, you know, this is what we do today. What would it look like for us as we go through and add in some two-factor authentication to comply with the policy? And we can create a, a no-charge workflow document for you. Um, so you can run that up the flagpole, talk to the budget folks, make sure that it complies with the overall organizational security posture. Um, next thing would... Uh, you know, look at some of the methods that may be best for you. We talked about three today. Those aren't the only three. There are some other ones out there on the market. Uh, but I think when it comes down to it, you're going to be looking at one-time password probably as the primary. And then uh, contact smart cards and fingerprint biometrics will probably be in a close second. Um, talk, talk to NetMotion. The next NetMotion sales channel understands uh, the compliance requirements. They, they understand uh, the integration between NetMotion and 2FA. We've done hundreds of deployments together, so we're working together on a daily basis. Our software is available for a free trial download of the client. Uh, it's not going to get through the one-time password component, but we have an online uh, hosted process that we can help you out there with. So, uh, But you can download the, uh, the software for free at 2FA.com, um, and we can show you out some free hardware that you can use to test. And uh, if you want to try the server, uh, there's a, a server trial that we can provide as well. So uh, generally what we see is folks download it within about five minutes or so. They've got a good understanding of whether or not it's going to be a right fit for them. And then they can go into a pilot or they go into more of a procurement type of discussion. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to John. And uh, that concludes my presentation. So it's subject to your questions. John? Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining. We'll open it up to questions now. Just, just a few notes, um, just so you're aware. Everyone that, everyone that registered for the webinar will get a copy of this, probably, uh, the recorded version of the webinar. Um, just Greg, just so you know, I was out of sync for about two slides there, but it was taken care of, so I apologize for that. Um, hopefully this was, was great information. Again, as Greg mentioned, this is kind of an introductory to the requirements, to how our companies can help you meet this requirement. Um, we've already had some customers already do implementations to meet the requirements, so it's great. Folks are start, starting now. But again, if you have any questions, um, we've got some time. We'll stay on the line. Please just use the question bar, and uh, we'll just take those. And it looks like we got one already. Um, here's a quick question, and maybe I'll, Greg, Greg or Seth, I'll throw this to one of you guys. Um, the question is if we support YubiKey. That's a good question. So uh, that would be a question for 2FA. Historically, we have not. Um, in our latest release, we have uh, enhanced support for broader tokens. So YubiKey uh, being a uh, one that is recent in the market but being very highly adopted, um, that's one.
person that we will be supporting, uh, and we probably will be supporting in the next month or so. So um, I think it's 4.5.7 is going to be uh, getting released by 2FA, and YubiKey uh, will be included. Now, again, from a pointer, uh, it'll be supported from the capability to authenticate to NetMotion, uh, like Citrix, uh, VPN type. It's not going to be supported at that time for Windows logon. And we will have Windows logon support for OTP probably coming up in Q1 of 2015. Great. Thanks, Greg. Other questions? Looks like it's a little bit quiet. Excellent. Okay, here's a quick, a quick question. Um, the question is, um, and, and I'll, I'll take this one, Greg, but maybe you can you can add color to it. The question is, and this person was joined a little bit late, but um, wanted to understand that the software is a, can be 100% in-house. And um, actually, Greg, maybe I'll let you take that question because I know sure. that you you guys have looked at a cloud offering well. Correct. Correct. So. The answer, the short answer to the question is yes. So the, I would say 95% of our customers have a full house, full in-house uh, solution. Um, from an architecture perspective, the server can be virtualized. It's installed on Windows Server 2008 or 2012. We do support 2003, but the market's kind of moved on from that. Uh, it installs on IIS. It leverages SQL. So very similar to the, Net, the NetMotion Mobility XD product architecture. Um, and it is installed in-house and managed by the customers. Uh, 2FA wouldn't have any access to that um, that solution. We also have a web or a cloud, 2FA1 cloud solution that is a uh, hosted solution at Amazon Web Services, uh, primarily for smaller organizations or multi-organizations where they, they don't have a centrally managed facility where multiple uh, organizations need to access or for smaller organizations that uh, either don't want to learn or, or don't have the uh, capacity to manage a, a system. Generally, a system like this, you're looking at about four hours a month for overall configuration, patch management, auditing, logging, those types of things. Uh, so it's not a, a very uh, labor-intensive system, but um, there are some organizations that have, have moved to 2FA1 Cloud, and that's a, uh, a subscription-based model. But as I said before, the majority of our of our uh, installations are on premise. Perfect. Anyone else? Any additional questions? Only once. <laughs> okay, great. Well, you know, as mentioned, everyone will get you'll get an email. Um, it actually, I, I think it'll actually come from me. Um, and so if you do have follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us directly. You can reach out to NetMotion Sales directly. I, again, as Greg mentioned, we work really close with 2FA, so, so they know how to get you to the right person. And again, thank you very much for joining. I hope this was good information. We'll, we'll definitely be doing more of these uh, down the road. But uh, this concludes the webinar. So thank you very much, folks.